Welcome to Parenting Teens with Dr. Cam, where we tackle the challenges of raising teenagers without the drama. I'm your host, Dr. Cam. Let's get on with the show. Today, we're embarking on a transformative journey with a true expert in the field of mental health and resilience, Dr. Carolyn Leaf. Dr. Leaf is not only a communication pathologist, audiologist, and clinical neuroscientist, but also a pioneer in the study of the mind-brain connection. With her extensive background in psychoneurobiology and metacognitive neuropsychology, Dr. Leaf has dedicated her career to understanding how our thoughts and emotions shape our brains. As a host of the podcast, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess, and the author of 18 best-selling books, including Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess and How to Help Your Child Clean Up Their Mental Mess, Dr. Leaf is a leading voice in the field of mental wellness. Join us as we learn from Dr. Leaf's wealth of knowledge and experience, gaining insights into how we can raise emotionally resilient teens in today's challenging world. Dr. Leaf, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. It's lovely to meet you and lovely to be with you today. You too. So tell us, first of all, how did you get into neuroscience and neurobiology and just understanding the connection between the mind and the brain? Well, that journey began probably when I was a young young child, I was very interested in the mind and the brain. I was going to become a neurosurgeon. I got into medical school and I decided that that's not really my road to go because I didn't want to just be doing surgery. I wanted to actually interact and understand more on a more theoretical, philosophical level. And so I moved over to a degree that they were offering at the time back in the 80s, which combined medicine and the sort of early days of neuroscience and neurology and psychology and communication pathology. And, and it was very based within hospitals and research based. Um, and so that really got me into this field. And I mean, there was only 60 of us that qualified in the world. And then they stopped mm. the degree because it was wiping everyone out. And I only say that to say that I nearly left. And I wish I and, and thank goodness I didn't, because that that training opened my mind to seeing the mind brain body connection in a mm. totally different way. And it, it launched the research I do and the work I do, and the millions we now reach. And so I'm very grateful for that. So that's kind of the background to why I am doing what I do. So explain to us a little bit about what you mean by the mind brain connection. What is the difference? Okay, so for thousands of years there was a very clear understanding of the the fact that we had a physical body and that there was something more sort of spiritual that kind of interacted with the body and that was actually the pretty accurate. It was very, in fact, very accurate. Then we had the whole sort of Descartes split where it was mind is separate from brain and they don't really interact and there's, you know, very clear splits and all, all these debates. And in the last 40 years, they kind of put that aside, not everyone, but a large body of science put that mind stuff aside and focused on the brain. And I saw this in the 40 years of the work I've been in the field because from, it was from the mid nineties that they discovered the MRI. Um, well, the, the technology was discovered in 44, but they actually but it was only by 96 that they actually got the MRI technology. So we started seeing in the brain. So long story short, the the world of, of neuroscience, neurology, um, and that, that world moved very much in the direction of um, neuroscience and all mm. brain, 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 brain. And, and it was great because we started understanding more about neurobiology and, and your neuroscience is the study of how that works and the neurons and the impact and so on. Um, but then we, we kind of put the mind aside. And so the de- philosophical debate of what is mind and it's the unknown variable and all that kind of stuff was was sort of, well, we can't measure it, which is actually inaccurate because we can, um, it, but you can't touch it, feel it, see it as easily as the brain. And the brain was just, it's fascinating. I mean, the brain's mm-hmm. fascinating. So we became a very neuro-reductionistic society. And that has impacted how we look at ourselves as humans, how we look at mental health, how we look at our adolescents growing up, our children growing up. And the, the impact has obviously there's always good, but there's also bad. And the bad side is it has um, had, had, has had a massive impact on mental health. So I, as I, I practice for 25 years and I've been doing research for 38 now, and I don't practice anymore because I decided I'm going to have more impact taking what I'm doing in my research and my clinical practice and putting that into accessible tools. We have a mental mm. health technology platform, web and iOS and Android, um, where we are, which we constantly developing and growing, where we are trying to empower an individual as well as teams of people, but people at every single human 
needs to know how to understand the mind brain body connection so that's what we're doing with the work so that's kind of a long foundation to what is the mind what is the brain so the mind is the easiest way to understand the mind is to think of waves of the sea and then mm-hmm. to think of waves of the sea um that that sort of energy that propels them so they, they don't just they're not just stagnant they're moving and as they move they move and change a frequency and then they hit the beach and they change the shape of the beach so the mind is this energy force that is creating this movement of stuff in the case of the wave example it's the particles in the in, in the case of the mind brain the, the mind is this wave of energy that is capturing our experiences the stuff the water in the waves and it puts it into the brain and the body and that's really important dr cam is to recognize that the brain and body operate as a unit mm-hmm. and the mind is driving the two so the brain and body without the mind are just basically like flesh they and they disintegrate but with the mind as an energy force gravitational fields and all the things that you pick up with an ekg and an eeg and ultrasounds and the fact that the blood flows and the heart pumps and all that is energy requiring that movement of blood and oxygen and so on that is driven by mind so mind is an energy force that has a mental component of you being a human and experiencing life and memory and all that and it has a neurophysiological component which is making the brain and the body actually work so the brain and the body um, embody the mind the mind is embodied in the brain body wide which is why when you have a ptsd experience you feel it in your body Mm. the the famous book the body keeps the score you know this is truth because it stores in the brain and the body so the brain the physical body is the physical the mind is also physical but it's a different type of physical it's way it almost pulls us all together it almost pulls it all together and becomes who we are so how do we use this information of of using the mind to help our kids. And let's talk about, I really wanted to talk with you about resilience, because I think this is a concept that we're constantly saying we want to build our teens resilience. We want to build up resilience. First of all, how do you even define resilience? And then once we know what that is, what do we do as parents to help build that up? I'm so glad you asked that question because as you you and I both know, that is such a common word used everywhere. It's on book covers, it's in conversations, it comes out all the time. And so it's something that we instinctively know as humans is important for us. And what we've been told in the last 30, 40 years, which has actually been disproved, is that we have limited supplies of resilience, mm. that we run out of resilience. But that's not actually the truth because your brain, mind, body, or psycho, neurobiology, mind, brain, body connection has unlimited supply of resilience. Our whole um, neurobiology, our psycho neurobiology, all of it is designed to stand up to the stresses of life. It's all designed to support. And even, and that doesn't mean it's all going to be easy. It's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that our basic psycho neurobiological foundation is one of resilience. So resilience is, in the most simple terms, is the ability that we have as humans to go through the knocks of life and to be able to mm. get back again. And it's very, very, very activated by our mindset so if you think of resilience as and uh, i was explaining this to someone the other day and it really worked so let me let me use it like this please this is an analogy in a book that i'm actually currently writing at the moment so you're getting a sneak preview of my of my next book um think of a door and a doorway that opens and that doorway that opens into just infinity you know we've seen images of that we've seen movies with that kind of analogy you you can you know you're just that feeling of this door now that's what resilience is like it's an when you open it, there's unlimited supply mm. of resilience. And that resilience is very quite spiritual. So it's, it's part of our non-conscious NON. Non-conscious is a scientific term that we have for this this mind thing of ours. And this end is oops, I just bumped something, sorry. <laughs> Um, so therefore, um, there's a door that shuts. Now, what opens and closes or unlocks a door and throws it wide or keeps it closed or only opens it a crack? It is how we use our mind. It's how we mm. manage our mind, how we looking at things in terms of, so mind is all of that stuff and how we manage our mind is going to show up in how we, in our mindset, our perceptions, it's going to show up in our behaviors it's going to show up in our signals i'm sorry in our emotions and it's going to show up in how our body feels yeah. so if we um and, and that collective emotions and perceptions and all that stuff if that is one if that if the overarching mindset that comes out of that is one of i'm fragile i am at the coddled mind i'm fragile i am 
broken if I've had trauma. That's it, TikTok mm. world. Um, there's a lot of, you know, that going on sort of self-diagnosis and, and not that I think TikTok's fantastic. I think all technology is fantastic when managed and we've got, it's a way of sharing messaging, but we've got to make sure that we accurate With the right share. messaging exactly so we are not and the messaging the zeitgeist is that this that it's um is that um resilience is limited and mm-hmm. that um if you have any kind of trauma or any kind of anything at any stage of your life that disrupts your functioning that you basically are reducing your your resilience it's getting less and that you've broken forever and that because you've broken forever uh, you need a label you need a diagnosis you potentially mm. need whatever and this is what our teenagers are growing up with. yes in alpha are growing up with. this is the messaging that the adults in their lives are also sending them it's what every psychiatric web Website shares. It's what every MD is talking about, you know, MD websites and this kind of thing. And there's a lot of truth, good in those. I'm not saying everything's bad, but this philosophy, this zeitgeist of if I'm broken, I'm always broken is wrong. Mm. Some of the, I did some of the mm. earliest work in neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is the ability that we have to change our brain and body with our mind. Mm. Our brain and body don't change themselves because they're not self-generating. They're physical that need to be switched on. So, but our mind changes. So if that if that's the foundation of how we, we, we wired in this incredible way, um, mind and brain and body, and we have this ability to change things. So when we shift our mindset to that, what we do is we see, okay, well, things have happened, but I'm not constantly broken. I can heal. I can't change my story, but I can change what it looks like inside the networks of the psychoneurobiology, my mind body connection. When I shift that mindset, I open that door. Maybe mm. initially it's a little crack. Maybe it's a little bit of a bigger crack, but eventually I learn how to open. And when the door closes, I keep knowing how to open it. But if I see myself as broken and I see myself as forever broken, and a damaged brain and damaged genes that I have no control over, you basically lock that door to resilience. Wow. And that's what worries me about the way our young, our, our children and our teen and adolescents are growing up and what a lot of adults are feeling. It's so true. The, you know, because I was going to ask, but you've explained it already, why kids today <laughs> seem so unresilient, right? They seem, but it's because from what you're saying, which is a big aha moment for me, is it's because we keep sending them messages that they're broken. And we do this in an attempt to fix them saying, oh, because you've, you're anxious, you're depressed, you're, you know, and we've got this belief that everything's kind of more serious than it is in a way, right? Everything is like yeah. clinically pro- a clinical problem. So now everywhere they go, there's, they're, we're pointing out where they're broken and that's where their resilience breaks down. Exactly. That okay. is exactly what happens. So we've got this constant message that is coming through every potential platform. And there is yeah. obviously the other side of science, which is um, a massive side of science that has disproved this this philosophy and has shown that that biomedical model is not working. Um, but that's not what the the multi the ninety five percent of the, of people globally um, it, globally think that they have depression because they have a chemical imbalance. That the depression is yeah. not from adverse life experiences; it's from a brokenness inside of them. And that actually doesn't remove stigma. The research shows it increases stigma. So first mm. of all incorrect secondly it's disproved and thirdly it makes the stigma worse fourthly it creates hopelessness yeah. learned hopelessness and you know we try and attempt to fix that by judy saying this concept of neurodiversity which is great because it actually starts saying to us that you know we're not we are different and there's a study that came out of yale in 2018 which is one i love to quote because they said there's no normal brain there isn't any normal brain mm. and we have this drive with with the current philosophy that hey this is a normal brain and your teenager your adolescent your child you are differing from the normal brain and that's why you're battling and that's not the truth because your brain constantly changes it's in, always in a state of flux and it yeah. follows the pattern of what your mind is doing and you even if you don't fix something like a substance abuse which is a behavior that's coming from some sort of trauma or brokenness even if you don't fix that it doesn't go away it just gets more entangled but it keeps changing everything's in flux and it's either in flux in the wrong or the right direction yeah. so the messaging we need to share with our children our adolescents and ourselves and adults is that we can change we, it's hard and there's a time frame involved, but we can change. 
The other side of this coin, which is very powerful on a sort of more psychological side, is that I mentioned the word non-conscious. We are predominantly non-conscious. Non-conscious doesn't mean unconscious. Unconscious is when you're sleeping and when you knocked out from anesthesia or a baseball bat, hopefully, or something <laughs> not like that. But um, our, our non-conscious is a state of of, um, of of functioning as humans that drives us 24-7. It's brilliant. It's the most brilliant part of how you function. It's where all your memories are stored. It's where your messes are made and where your your the where you where your messes are found. Um, and so it, it works for you. It's stores things it's a it's a force of of nature it's a force of you that is enabling you to to function and it's uh, your conscious mind only operates when you're awake and it, your your conscious mind is very reliant on the non-conscious mind mm. but the non-con the non-conscious mind doesn't do the changing it does the prompting it's the conscious mind that does the changing which means we have to consciously and deliberately recognize yeah. our patterns and do the changing and work with the non-conscious so the non-conscious will help us but we've got our conscious has got to do the changes so we've got to be deliberate and intentional now the other side of that is that we are in a world that we're immersed in a world of that's very easy to be immersed in it um Every age has its challenges. Our challenge this this current age is that our immersion is vast. It's huge and it's it's accessible knowledge. So when I say immersion, we're getting access to stuff very fast and very quickly. We're mm. getting feedback very quickly. We're getting which is great in one sense because our brain loves that, but if it's not managed, it's, it creates chaos. So ninety five percent, if not more, of what is going on around you in the in the zeitgeist, the articles you read, the TikToks, the social media, the conversations, the voices being spoken over you, what you're hearing at school, etc., that is going into your psyche yeah 95 percent, and you're not even aware you're only aware of around about one to five percent so that 95 that's going in is driving you because if you're hearing it all the time whatever's going in consistently is becoming a pattern that drives you so we're dealing with conscious be being uh, consciously being aware of focusing on stuff but most people don't know that 95 percent is going in unconsciously mm. that that comes through as signals and what we need to do is learn to self-regulate um, yeah. and recognize and read the signals and then make the changes and that's bas the basic sort of idea of a lot so, of neuroscience and neuro so, neuro and I, I love this and i love the whole you know rewiring and neuroplasticity and how do we as parents use this knowledge um, and we've already talked about we want to build a resilience a lot of what we're doing to build a resilience based mm -hmm. of what you just said is actually making them less resilient because we're trying to fix them, yeah. right, to build them. So what do parents do to help build up our children's resilience or open up that door wide open for them? Three parts to that answer. It's a great, it's a, it's a great question. It's a great, great question. The first thing is we model it for them because, because mm. our children and our adolescents will really do what we do. You know, it's easy to say something. It's much more difficult to model it. Um, so that's very, very important. I often get asked this question and they say, what would you, if you, for this current crisis, which has also been mis explained, um, but what would I do with this current mental health crisis? And, I, and the first thing I'll say is educate the parents, mm -hmm. educate them on what the truth is about mental health and educate them on how to manage their own mental health with the yeah. correct philosophy. Stop making it so scary because going hand in hand with resilience, which goes to the education we need to give to our parents and ourselves is that um, resilience is something that is, is it's infinite and it can constantly be activated. Um, so we, we've got to give that, we've got to give that message. So it's train, train the parents mm. first. So when we model our own stuff, when we're going through something and we recognize that there's a natural pattern, for example, to healing from depression, and if you give it its natural cycle and you just support with love, you'll get through most, what the research is something like 90 plus percent of people will get through that depression phase because it's not a disease, it's a, it's, it's a warning signal. In, an, in a natural cycle. And if you interfere with that cycle, you actually can make things worse. So it's mm. to give parents that kind of knowledge and then for parents to be able to say, like if they've had a bad day or they're going through something, not to deny it and pretend you know everything because you don't, but to show your vulnerability as a human and to say, oh, I'm really batting. Sorry, I am I snapped at you. I lost my cool. I was more aggressive than I should be. I, um, I, it doesn't mean I, it's not you. It is something that I'm going through. Yes, what you said may have triggered me. So you actually go through a process of, of of 
openly acknowledging your emotions and behaviors and so on and, and reflecting on those and, and actually being a, and showing them what that is. But you don't stop there. You actually go to a point of resolution. So you say, well, this is it happened like this because of I think this is why I'm doing this. I'm going to find out and this is how I'm going to reconceptualize it. And this is what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. So when you model that process, which is a five step process called the neurocycle, which is based on how my information gets into our mind brain body network in the first place how does life get in us and then how can we reverse engineer the impact and then mm. actually construct that and so it's a simple pro it's a simple process that you can learn and as a parent you learn that and you demonstrate that then you teach it to your children and that's what both this book plus the children's book um where's my children's book over here? i don't know if you guys can see it over here how to help your i think child. it's behind you too yeah yeah there you go perfect yeah to have a put young children you have a coloring book we even have a toy which um, is, i love it i want the coloring book the coloring book's great <laughs> create scenarios we even have a toy the little brain wow walks your mental health journey with you um the coloring book is, is scenarios that can happen and how to, for a child that's young to be able to color that in and find the page and then you've got a blank page where you can interact so in other words it's to provide that um so that first part is use a parent learn it use parent get educated you model secondly is you then help your child apply this and that's why i give you the tools we have in the app as well the mm -hmm. neuro app which has you can learn it for yourself and we have a parent application we constantly up grading that um, all the time. We even have a NeuroLive feature, Dr. Cam, that we've added where every week I um, work, or teach, explain something and answer questions. And in other words, that's how, because people say, okay, that's great. I need the knowledge as a parent. I need to model, but what do I do? So the second part of the answer is, these are, I've got the tools, um, the NeuroCycle, we can even talk a bit more about what that is. I'm happy to explain it. And, um, and then the, what was the third thing? Third, um, okay, I've, I can I can't remember what the third thing was. It'll come back in a moment. But the main let's thing talk was, about the neuro cycle and having, and having and a then tool. we'll go into that. <laughs> it'll, it'll pop back in my mind. Yes, it will. Okay, so the neuro cycle is based on thirty eight years of research and was initially developed based on my work on neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. In the 80s, we went through a weird phase between the 70s and 80s where they believed that the brain couldn't change. So for years, there was the belief that, and then suddenly there was this period of time where for about 30 years that they didn't believe the brain could change and that changed in the 90s with technology when we saw the brain changing. And so I was told that the brain couldn't change and I remember challenging one of our professors and saying that but we, we change, our life changes. We never right. the same. So therefore the brain that the mind uses and I remember saying, you, you've just told us in this neurology lecture, in this neuroscience, combined neuroscience, neurology lecture, that the mind changes the brain, but you're telling us the brain can't change. So there's a paradox. And basically, this professor said, you know, for women in science back in the 80s, oh, well, facetiously said to me, well, go and do the research, thinking I wouldn't do anything. But I did. I took the challenge, did the research, and showed that if you manage your mind, you can change your brain. And that's where the mm. neuroscience it was born out of literally that lecture. It drove me and it still drives me because never again do I want, first of all, sexism, patriarchy, whatever you want to call it, to come into anyone's life. And secondly, that's not truth. The truth is right. that there's hope in our humanity, there's hope in our ability. And so the neurocycle grew out of that. So I, I work with people with traumatic brain injury initially because I took, because this professor also said, take the worst, take, take, he really said, do brain injury because there's no hope. That's pretty much right. what he said. Worst, worst case scenario. That's it, yes. I said, oh, and I didn't quite pick up the the sort of undercurrent there. And I actually said, oh, okay. And I went and studied and could hardly find any research on her closet injury mm. at, the at the time. Long story short, I show that, um, that if you help a person with a traumatic brain injury, you can actually help them transform their life. So I, I work with people that were in, that were had shortly come out of comas, that were non-functional, um, and quite extreme changes just happened in sort of up under 12 months they would go from like a um they would go from let's say it was the one case was a 16 year old who had basically sort of lost all functionality and was like functioning at about a second grade level within 12 months caught up with her peer group went on to get degrees and i can tell you a thousand similar stories wow. well, i soon saw and then i was in south africa at the time in at that time working in the pre the pre transition and post apartheid era working in the terrible conditions there in the education system people that weren't educated, full of trauma. And I started applying these principles and I very quickly saw that through mind management, I can't come in and feed and fix what our government had done and mm -hmm. what 
any kind of racism does, but what I could do is equip an individual with the ability to deal with that emotional impact and then to help to rewire and then also help to, them to learn. Because if you think about it, if you are rewiring your brain, you also, you also need to put knowledge in. We need knowledge. Right. Um, so that, that then led to the NeuroCycle. The NeuroCycle was birthed out of all of that. And it's basically taken a complex process and simplified into five basic steps that um, are the steps that your mind brain body connection goes through and it's like flying a plane your brain's got to be prepared it's got to take off it's got to fly and it's got to land it's a cycle it's something you would do daily um, over a period of time because as you do the neuro cycle you're rewiring the mind brain body connection so you're forming a new habit so habits don't form in 21 days so a lot of the research i've done was to find out how long does it take yeah if I this process if I do it once does it work and I saw no it does if I do it twice does it work if I do it 10 days in a row so I wanted to find out how often how long and the, the bottom line and we still do research we've just done another study I published papers we've got a paper coming out this month and for, for this year we're doing more studies um, but basically it takes around nine weeks to mm. require a network so in the first wow. three weeks of working daily and I will tell you what the neuro cycle is but in the first three weeks of working through the neurocycle daily, you will basically um, find what those signals, the, the depression, the anxiety, those things in your body, the perspective, those are just signals. They're not symptoms of a disease. They're signals of an experience. Mm. So in the first 21 days, you'll, you'll be able to learn to recognize the signals, dig into those signals, find the thought, which is the experience that they're attached to and find the source, the root, and reconstruct. You can't pull the thought out. You can't like a plant. You can't pull it out. Um, it's, it, it, it's always there, but you can change what it looks like. So you can heal the roots for mm. that sounds to, to all of us. Um, and I've got great images in here to be able to explain, for parents to explain to children. So you basically are healing the roots and so on. And that process takes around three weeks. Okay. But then you've got this tiny little newly formed thought in your mind as a wave pattern in your brain as a little tree-like structure and then in your body cells as hedges. So if you mm -hmm. recall at the beginning, and I know this is quite a lot to digest, but if you recall at the beginning, we said that in, that memory and experiences are, are a body-wide thing. The body right. keeps the score that people hear about. We know that people go to yoga to release the energy. We know that exercise helps depression. Well, I'm talking about that, okay? So I'm talking about the fact that every experience we have, that traumatic experience, be, it became, it was an experience that was ex taken in by your mind, processed by your mind, and stored in your brain as a tree-like structure in every cell of your body as a hedge-like structure, like a little hedge, tightly packed hedge, and in your mind as a little wave pattern. So three places, and the wave pattern's kind of keeping the whole thing going. So that's what you're doing with the neurocycle is you are opening those all up, you're finding them, and you are reorganizing them. So they never go away, but instead of staying like, staying like a tsunami wave and a very prickly, toxic-looking tree and a hedge that's all ugly and full of thorns you actually clean it up that's basically what you're doing and that process takes um, about it takes about 15 minutes a day for about three weeks then it's tiny if it's going to be useful to you you're going to be able to apply that in your life and mm -hmm. you start at 21 you're not going to be able to it's not enough time because it's still too small it has to be made bigger yeah. So the next 42 days, you still do the neurocycle, but for less time, and you then basically are growing it bigger and making it stronger. So I'll walk you through this in the app, in this book, in the children, in the adult book, all of it. Um, so that you know, to get the combination, that's a good combination. You don't have to, but um, if people want to know what the resources are. Okay, so in essence, what do you do each day? What is the neurocycle? It's five steps for the first 21 days. You do it for around 15 minutes a day. First couple of days will take longer as you learn the system. Mm -hmm. And then the second set of 42 two days totaling 63 which is nine weeks so 63 days is nine weeks you're going to spend about five minutes a day still going through the five steps so that's a minute per step so we're not talking about hours of time no Even not at all children, you know it may take a little longer initially because you're teaching your kids how to do it and whatever adolescents love the app because it's technology you know yeah. and, got, and there's a lot of support things like decompression activities and there's all kinds of whatever to do extra so th there's the five steps are we've got to prepare the plane and we've got to get the plane to take off. So step one is preparing the plane and getting the plane to take off. So that's basically preparing the brain are things like breathing and meditation and um, just getting yourself in the right mindset. There's 
a million different activities and I provide a lot of examples in my materials and walk you through in, in the app. Then also part of that, once I've prepared the brain and I've got it to a place of sort of the mind, brain and body chemicals calm down and we've got the, the energy of the brain calm down and the heart's not beating too fast and the electromagnetic energy of the heart's calm down. When we're in that, that state, we are in a state where neuroplasticity can happen in the right direction. Gotcha. Neuroplasticity is always happening, but you can drive it in the right direction, okay? So that's the gather weird. So then you, you get yourself calm. Then you focus on um, gathering awareness of your emotions, which are not diseases. You say a little sentence, what am I feeling? How, where do I feel this in my body? So bodily sensation. How is this affecting my behavior? So this is in the moment. It's not like mm -hmm. in my whole life. It's not general. It's specific to the moment. And then how is this affecting my perspective? So maybe it's depression, gut ache, um, withdrawing, life sucks. And right. then you're going to, so that's now the plane's taken off. Okay. And now I'm going to, as it's taking off that um, preparation and identifying those four signals leads me to, it will pull up a thought because those signals are attached to the experience, which is a thought, which is made of memories. Right. And so I won't see all of it yet, but I'll see, oh, okay, maybe this is related to whatever. So maybe it's self-esteem. Um, I've got no value. And maybe that comes up and there's a thought, oh, okay, I see there's something that there about I'm not good enough, a lot of self-talk. Maybe there's something there from when I was a child or an adolescent or recently at the new school or whatever. So you're starting to see something. So that's the, that's pulling up the thought. So it's something to do with self-esteem. Uh, we've just taken off. Now we start flying. And in flying, we're going to reflect. What, why? The who, the what, the when, the where, the why. Mm. What's get more information then you're going to still fly and you're going to do a mind dump where whatever's been stimulated by the what you've just done you just write that down really quickly onto a piece of paper whatever comes up i have a structure called the metacog i'm not going to go into it now but there's a way of organizing information that really makes this very effective but it's a mind dump it's not journaling right. then you're still flying you need to now look at what you've written which is accumulation of the three steps the first three steps taking off flying and now you're going to reconceptualize what does this mean this has happened mm. what do about this and then you end off at with step five which is then landing the plane with an act of reach which is an action um to help you to be able to anchor yourself so it's accumulation of the work done that you've done that day you it's a full stop you stop there you don't carry on or you exhaust yourself and every time you want to go back to it you, you use your active reach to help anchor you and to help stabilize the new thought, thought that's forming you're not going to solve it today you have to you have to do it over 63 days so you come back to it tomorrow and so it's a little bit every day accumulates and builds and that's how habits new habits form that's how new thoughts form and form into habits so that's the basic principle of operating and there's a lot more to it but those that's the basic principle oh yeah i thought it was I thought we had run out of time, but we still have a bit of time for you. No, we do. So this yeah. is almost from, from what I'm hearing too, it's almost reteaching you how to process your feelings and your thoughts. It's not just it's the one bad. thought that we're reprocessing. It's just retraining how we process everything exactly. that comes through where we're just not, this is reality. It's going, okay, this is what I'm sensing. How do I get to turn that into a more productive thought? rather than one that's just tearing me down. Absolutely. You've totally got it. You said the word process. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what you do. You are driving that as you do those five steps, you are literally taking, pulling up that thought and using your mind energy to yeah. go and find that thought and to deconstruct and reconstruct it. Right down yeah. to the root. You can't pull it up, but you can change what it looks like inside of you. So you're doing exactly that. You are change, You're looking at the self-talk. You're looking at the, and you're actually going down deep and you're saying, okay, well, this happened. I can't change that person did that. I can't find out why. Why did that person bully me? They're going through stuff. I don't need to know why they bullied me. I just need to know that my behaviors are coming from that. So yeah. it's not me. There's a because of. And so I reconceptualize. What can I do going forward? Okay, that bullying, I can release. I can whatever. So there's, that's what you're doing. What is happening a lot, Dr. Cameron, I know you know this. I'm telling you, I feel like I'm speak, pre preaching to the choir here. So forgive me um, for those of you that are listening is that there's a huge movement 
and there has been for a few years now, to get your child to name their feelings, even mm-hmm. your adolescent. There's feeling circles, there's all kinds of programs going on in schools. And the research has shown that that's actually causing more problems. Um, if we constantly say, you know, how are you feeling? How are you feeling? Gentle parenting. Now, I'm all for gentle parenting, but I'm not all for constantly asking your child, how are they feeling? Because if you just ask your child how they're feeling, or you just talk, um, to, it's, let's have a feeling circle. How do you feel about this? How do you, What you've done is you've just brought up a bunch of stuff and then you leave it there. So that's like like taking off in the plane, but you don't, you've never been taught as a pilot how to fly a plane. What's going to happen? You're going to crash. So yeah. you just do meditation with kids in schools, which is what is happening. I'm glad they're doing meditation and short studies show that, um, that's, and I say short studies, short studies over short periods of time do show changes in cortisol and that kind of thing. We've shown that too. But if you just meditate, you bring the thought up. Mm. And if you bring the thought up, but you don't give the person the tools to to deconstruct that thought and process through, like you said earlier on, they're going to crash. So that's why we need the entire cycle. If you're going to ask a child how they feel, do not do it all the time. Do it for limited periods of time. One block in the day. If you're going to do it at school, one block in the day. If something happens at school, don't spend hours asking these kids how they feel. Yes. It's better to actually, you know, talk about the situation, go through a neurocycle. Okay, it's very yeah. quickly. This happened. Okay, so how did that make you feel quick? Where did you feel that in your body? What did, what was the, what was the, how did you um, see that? What was your mindset? Okay, why did this happen? Okay, let's write that down. Let's just put all our thoughts on the, on the, on the board or whatever. And okay, what are we going to do about this? This happened. What are we going to do? Okay, what's the action? Let's do it. They're not doing that. They're not going no. through this. They're pulling it up and they, and these kids are coming. They've got all the stuff that's been activated. They don't know what to do with that energy. So what happens? They don't concentrate at school. They get labeled as ADHD. They get depressed because they're being teased by their children. They get labeled with di- and depression. They get put on uh, meds that have been shown to be, be t- very dangerous for children and yeah. adults. And they get put on meds that are multiple diagnoses, multiple meds. Mm. And that, and then the child now sees themselves as broken. That's even more dangerous than the yeah. meds. It's even and that's what kills resilience. That's what kills resilience. We come all the way back. You've closed the door. You've locked it. But there is a key, and you can unlock it. So there's always hope. Yeah. So we keep going through that. So help me understand, too, because I know there's a lot of confusion. A lot of the parents I work with have this struggle between coddling and building and, and empathy, right? Supporting. So when I, when I describe empathy, they immediately go, well, that's coddling. We got to toughen them up. This is why kids are so, you know, weak this day or can't handle anything is that we got to toughen them up. Okay. So how do we do- draw that distinction? Such a good question. And, and I, and I know what's happened because you've swung from the coddle to the, uh, we've swung from pull up, just pull yourself together to, yeah. oh gosh, you know, let's, so there's two there's two extremes so you can't wallow and you also can't have toxic positivity right. you know so it's to find and that's what i'm hearing you say you know how do we get that balance between you know not being too harsh and whatever it once again comes with you modeling that whole entire cycle so yeah. if something happens um, you take it back to yourself and say, okay, that situation happened to me. This is what I, and something similar, because we can always find something similar in something similar. If it's not exactly the same as what your, your, your child has experienced, maybe it was, then maybe they were bullied in a specific thing. Maybe at some time you were bullied. Maybe you weren't, but maybe you know of someone who was bullied at some point at whatever. Find an example and say, mm-hmm. okay, this is what happened. Let's go through how it made us feel, whatever, the whole neuro cycle. So you sit down and you constructively discuss through. So there's no coddling. There's also no denial. Because if we suppress and say, pull yourself together, that's the worst thing you can do as well. It's as bad as coddling. Because yeah. the coddling is confusing. It brings all kinds of stuff up and doesn't teach them resilience. And um, it, it, it doesn't unlock the resilience and grow, help resilience to grow. And the other side is just plain well, I don't, um, there's something wrong with me. I can't do this. What's wrong with me? They, they don't care enough. Or they're a child, an adolescent, and even an adult child will bring it back to what's wrong with yeah. me. And when that starts happening, that's going to result in all kinds of behavioral problems. So I talk about in my work, safety net parenting versus helicopter parenting. Mm. What parents are talking about is they, they recognize helicopter parenting is not great. They recognize yeah. that there's a lot of us out there. <laughs> And we've gone through an era where we must helicopter, you know, all the influences and gosh, there's been such a lot of damage done in that, in that respect. And all these sort of 
social media psychiatrists and psychologists and whatever that do it some do and some don't have qualifications and a lot of them are talking a lot of scary stuff um is we've gone through that era of you know there's like a shift again from coddled with children to this is not working so okay. safety net parenting i believe is a great way of understanding this um and i was having this debate with a bunch of um, academics on pbs actually the other day we were talking about this um and so safety net parenting is think of an a circus think of the acrobats mm -hmm. think of the big steps up the side and these different levels there's like maybe five or six different levels with little uh, little um, ledges where they stand on and then they swing and there's you know different heights and they can jump through from one side to the next and they catch hoops and they catch each other and all those things that they do and at the bottom there's a safety net so safety net parenting is you the safety net you've got to let your child climb up the, the level yes. as they are younger as they get stronger as they get older and you've got to let them jump off the ledge and swing and maybe that other maybe they'll get to the other side maybe they'll not make and they'll fall and when they fall yeah. that's when you say okay i'm here for you is the consequences let's now analyze how did that make you go through the neuro cycle yeah. what are we going to do about it and that's that's would be my offer my the solution i would offer that is so key because i think you know, and we talk about the resilience and the feeling broken and what happens when parents are helicoptering and jumping in and saving them and preventing them from fail, from failing, we're telling them that you're not good enough to do it exactly. on your own. You're exactly. going, and it's not okay to fail. And so now they're terrified, which is the reverse of resilience. Now exactly. I'm just too scared to do anything. Exactly. And that failure is, you know, we, failure is the opportunity to learn. Like Edison yes. said, he was asked about the light bulb. What do you think about your thousand and one, whatever failures? He said, I, I know there's a thousand and one things I know don't work. You know, yeah. we reframe that for the child and see that we have to fail to, we have to fall. We have to be sad. We have to be depressed. Depression tells us stuff. Don't try and avoid the depression. Don't try and avoid the anxiety. Right. Face it and find out the information that it contains. That mind shift. There's a great study that came out of University of Tokyo and um, University of the Texas. And it was a few years back. And it was basically showing that when we shift our mindset to see um, the hardships of life, the depression, the anxiety, the failures, as something that we can learn from, which is yeah. what we feel no. They just confirmed it with scientific study. We actually shift our neurophysiology to be able to function better. And that's what I showed with my research as well. So yeah, we got to shift the perspective. It is amazing how much of our experience and how much of our own view of ourselves is impacted simply by the stories we're telling ourselves in our head. Absolutely. Like everything and, and be becomes our reality. And we become so convinced on that reality that we do everything to protect that reality and we get stuck with it. And we, we just need to shift it, which sounds like just is not the word to use. Shifting the mind is not an easy thing to do. No. And I love your steps to do it. That's so useful. Time, there's steps. There's a guided daily process. And yeah, it's, it's totally. It's big. Yeah. So what out of all this? And I, I could talk to you literally probably for days. Um, <laughs> there's so many questions I have for you. But what is one big takeaway that you want parents to have after this episode? I think there's, gosh, one is hard, but to I know. <laughs> say, maybe summarize everything, it would be really, you can't change what's happened to you or to your child, but you can, for yourself, change how, what it looks like inside of you and therefore how it plays out into your future. And you can help your child recognize that and embrace that and change moving out into the future. So let's stop pathologizing childhood and let's stop medicalizing misery, to quote, yeah two great um, psychiatrists in this field, um, Joanna Moncrief and I think it's Mark Horowitz who said the other one. And let's, let's move forward. Let's send me to Mimi is the one who said don't pathologize childhood because that's mm -hmm. what we're doing. Uh, you pathologize childhood, you cripple your child, you bubble wrap yeah. them, you don't help them, you're not teaching them anything. We've got to, failure is good. It's a good thing. It teaches us, as you said. Yeah. It's, I think the biggest hurdle is overcoming our own fear as parents. We've been made so scared. The yeah. whole parenting thing has become something that, and yes, there's been bad parents all through the ages, and we don't, we're not talking about the extremes of abusive parenting. But on average, a parent is, if you follow your gut, mm -hmm. you know what to do. And sometimes, you know, getting too much advice can be 
a problem. So I'm always like, like giving advice and me saying we've got materials and things. Be very selective. If you're if the material that you choose to listen to or watch or use is not equipping you to be empowered and yeah. not equipping your child to be empowered to move forward forward in a very self regulating ma- manner, and it's making them reliant on a technique, a, well, not a technique, on a drug or a label. Mm-hmm. If it's breaking them, if it's not building them, if it's pathologizing normal yeah. adverse life experiences and pathologizing them, then I would steer very clear and far away from it. Yeah. We've got to get balance again. Yeah, I love that. Dr. Leaf, how can people find you? I know there's a lot of ways. <laughs> well, my social media handles are Dr. Caroline Leaf, and I'm on all the normal platforms. And basically from Instagram, you can get everywhere. My web um, uh, um, drleaf.com is my my webpage and my books are available everywhere including on our site the NeuroCycle app is available on Google iTunes and we have a web version too um, the little book and brainy the book and the brainy that's on our website these aren't available these aren't only available on our, these are only sorry available on our website right. I have a podcast called Cleaning Up the Mental Mess where I teach a lot of stuff um, like you do and there we go. There's lots of options. <laughs> and in, so the web, in the NeuroCycle, there's the, the NeuroLive webinar, which is like a NeuroCycle club where I cover all kinds of aspects and answer questions. So that's a great extra resource to listen to. It's like a podcast within the within the app, but it's very specific to these types of um, specific things of how do I do life. Oh, I'm listening to that. I love this stuff. Dr. Leaf, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your great questions and for your great work. It's been lovely meeting you. Lovely meeting you too. And that's a wrap. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode of Parenting Teens with Dr. Cam. Don't forget to hit follow so you don't miss a single episode and share the love by passing this on to a friend. Until next time, keep making a positive impact in your teen's life.